Welcome back, everyone. It's been about a month since the last time anything and everything has aired. I'm your host, producer, Halima Sharif. You know, every time I look at that montage, I get a little teary-eyed. Um, you know, I guess that's the woman and the beauty of all of us. A little bit about myself. I'm the owner of HS Global Consulting, a woman minority-owned communications public relations consultancy. I've been in business for over 12 years. I'm an executive level media, corporate, and public relations professional with over 30 years of global experience in multiple industry sectors. I've lived and worked throughout the US and abroad. I started this online platform back in June of 2020 to bring attention to the beauty and diversity of humanity and to share that we all have a story to tell. Well, I must tell you, it's been a whirlwind because I truly can't believe that I have produced 21 episodes since June, and this is number 22. So I am truly grateful. Our last segment featured four young female artists who are doing phenomenal work in Qatar, Sudan, and Brazil. Then we had two amazing young female entrepreneurs, PJ's Coffee franchise owner and founder of 828 Enterprises, Brittany Simmons Willis, and vocalist owner of Beyond the Stage, Joelle Dyson. And then our first live Women of Color Catalyst segment aired on October 22nd, 2020, where we welcome Working Mother Media's president, Suba Berry, 
Global fashion design expert Sandra Wilkins, comedian actress Lunell, attorney and partner for Winston and Strawn, and now current chief of staff to First Lady Jill Biden, Melissa Reynosa, and director of diversity and inclusion for the House of Representatives, Kimba Hendricks. So if you miss any of these segments or shows, you can view them on Anything and Everything YouTube channel, as well as listen to them on all major podcast platforms. Just type Anything and Everything with Halima Sharif. You can also visit the website at www.anythingandeverythingmedia.com for updates. We recently added another segment to the Any and Everything platform, and now we have women of color catalysts and their allies. As you can see, our cycle continues to grow, which means we've got a lot to talk about. I'm very excited about this segment and future segments as we will invite guests from far and wide. And today on this new platform, in honor of Mother's Day, with the theme, a mother or just one another, a conversation of connection with six remarkable women whom I've known for a very long time, and not to mention, we have all worked together in the past, and we continue to work together now. I am so grateful for their presence in my life. Well, on that note, I would like to introduce them in the order in which I have met them personally. Kim Robinson. I have known my sister Kim since the 80s. She's my sister in faith from New Orleans. Kim and I are currently observing Ramadan. Ramadan Mubarak to my Muslim brothers and sisters across the globe. Kim is dedicated to helping her community and empowering others. You will often find her involved in matters of public health, civic engagement, workforce development, and societal concerns such as advocating for the reactivation of injustices and inequality in diverse communities, labor and education reform. And for those of you in New Orleans, y'all may see Kim hanging out at Audubon Park Walk and giving her little motivational pitches for the morning. Kim recently traveled to California for an Oscars watch party to support the documentary Time, which is based on a couple that robbed a credit union in Shreveport, Louisiana, and how a mother was on a selfless journey to free her husband who had been sentenced to serve for 60 years. The couple, Sybil Fox and Rob Richardson, are friends of Kim. Sybil fought relentlessly for a sentence reduction and thank God Rob was granted clemency in 2018 after serving 21 years. The producer of the documentary is Garrett Bradley. So go check it out y'all, you can watch it on Prime and it's available the original movie. Matter of fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up pictures. This was Kim at the event in the, in uh, California, and that's Sybil and Rob. So please go on Prime to check it out. Kim, once again, Kim is a wonderful mother. She's a sister friend. She's my girl. She's a grandmother. She's a friend. She's an ally. Bottom line, Kim is the truth. Welcome, my sister. L.P. Griffin. L.P. and I met in New York back in 2006. We worked together in a PR capacity for Uniworld Multicultural Advertising. I have always enjoyed working with L.P. One of my favorite bragging moments about L.P. is that she is a darn good writer. And I know she hates when I say that, but I'm gonna just go out there and say it. Listen, world, she is an excellent writer. And guess what? She used to write speeches for James Earl Jones. Let me say that again. She's an excellent, superb writer. Well, let me tell you something. I do know some great writers. There are great writers on this call right now. But Elkie has a way with words where her selections always seem to flow at any given moment. She's an eloquent, poetic writer who is able to directly connect you to the past, the present, and the now. Aside from work, Elkie is truly a dear friend. Although she is not a mother, she's an auntie, she's that sister friend, she's an ally, she's that shoulder to cry on. Bottom line, she is the truth. <laughs> then we have Elizabeth Margulies, my sister, my friend, my partner in making great things happen, my editor, my laughing buddy. I can go <laughs> on and on about Elizabeth. <laughs> It seems like every time Elizabeth and I get together, we can't stop laughing or talking. No matter how long we go without connecting, we always pick up where we left. Mm -hmm. 
I met Elizabeth in 2007 while working at the American Lung Association's national headquarters. I was communications and she was marketing. And together, we made some amazing things happen. Elizabeth is a mother, wife, auntie, sister friend, and so much more. She and I are always making a thing to do together in our personal and business lives. Elizabeth has always had such a pleasant, joyful demeanor. She truly defines authenticity in every way. Laura Quinn, my girl, Laura, <laughs> my sister, my friend, my brainstormer, my campaign theme generator, who, came, who actually was responsible for the title of this event. Although she's not a mother, she is too an ally, a support, and her nieces and nephews favorite auntie. Laura and I, like Elizabeth, met at the national headquarters at the American Lung Association. I thought it was a I thought I was a fast talking ball of energy, but Laura <laughs> and I can go back and forth. I always think of a time back when Laura and I were preparing for one of our national conferences and where we would present, we were presenting as communicators. Man, we were just talking and talking, and then we realized that it appeared as though we were in a tennis match. The only <laughs> difference is that we weren't competing with each other. We were just cohesively and aggressively working together as think tanks, two think tanks. Laura has an amazing background in communications, marketing, and business development. She's also a major supporter of nonprofits aimed at making a difference for humanity. As a matter of fact, she and Mary Bill are the co-owners of Living for a Cause, an organization which transforms passion into visible results. The organization works to improve the everyday lives of people, animals, and the planet. And we all share this information. Um, look at me, I'm reading something else. Um, well, I'm going to actually share. I'm going to say I'm going to share this once I get to to Laura to can't even talk today. Once I get to Mary's intro, I'm going to share more about living for a cause and put it on the screen. Mary Seville, my dear Mary, Mary is such a wonderful human being who often reminds us of God's beauty and grandeur. I met Mary during the same time I met Elizabeth and Laura. Mary was and continues to be that extraordinary volunteer for the American Lung Association and many other causes. She is one of the most dedicated and committed people I know when it comes to supporting the causes that matter. Mary is a loving stepmother, auntie, sister, friend, supporter, ally. She is a true cheerleader and always supports the goodness and beauty of humanity. Mary is the co-founder as well of Living for a Cause, along with Laura. So once again, please support this organization. Let me put it up on the screen for you guys to see. It's Living for a Cause. And just go to the website and you'll get as much information as possible. It's a great organization. Now, on to Linda Carter. Linda Carter. Child, I don't even know what to start with Linda. I can tell you so much about her. I met this wonderful woman in Cutter while we worked for ZDC Arts Cutter. She was the director of human resources. Linda is an amazing, and I do mean amazing in every way. I call Linda Miss Boss Operations Lady. She's my eyes, ears, analyst, advisor, sergeant at arms, confident, laughing to no end partner, and so many other things. Linda loves to have fun. She enjoys every moment that life has to offer. She has a pleasant demeanor, but is also a matter of fact kind of person. When Linda gives you advice, that's something you don't want to not listen to. So you better listen because she is the real deal. Linda is a wonderful mother, grandmother, auntie, sister, friend, and supporter. She loves her children, her grandchildren, her family, and friends. And she is always willing to go that extra mile now, let me go back to the laughter. When I tell you, Linda and I, just like Elizabeth and everyone else on this call, will talk about anything and everything. Trust me, we do. And boy, we really do have a good laugh. I love and appreciate all of these wonderful women. And I'm so grateful for their presence in my life, as I said earlier. And I thank them for embarking upon this journey with me as women, business associates, mothers, sisters, friends, and allies. It's great to know I have friends like these women who are very supportive and understanding. The beauty of our gathering and our sisterhood is that we are women of different backgrounds, 
And part of our intention is to celebrate diversity and inclusion because in light of recent events like Black Lives Matter, we are celebrating us. In other words, as my girl Laura said, we are part of the solution revolution. So on that note, let's get this show started. And I'd like to start with question number one, and we'll go in this order as far as who will answer first. We'll start with Linda, Elizabeth, Elkie, Laura, Mary, and Kim. And the first question is, the theme for this segment is a mother or just one another, a conversation of connection honoring Mother's Day. As we know, everyone isn't a mother for whatever reason. However, at the end of the day, we're all women who came from women. So how does this theme of our segment personally resonate, resonate with you, Linda? The thing personally resonates with me um, because I think, when I think of, of the theme, I think about nurturers. Um, I feel like um, mothers are nurturers not just mothers who bear children, but I have friends who are mothers to so many children that um, are not their birth children, but they are as much mother to them as I am to my children. So when I think of the thing, uh, I, I think uh, nurturer, which covers uh, a broad range uh, people, so that could be people who um, who bore their own children, people who have raised other people's children, um, like stepmothers who marry and and have a, an immediate family, and they become immediate mothers and nurturers. Um, the same with uh, fathers. I think that for me, this um, is nurturer. That's how I see it. Elizabeth? Um, I agree totally with Linda. I mean, I think um, the key is the word nurturer. And I think um, we all have had different things in our lives. Um, I lost, as, as you guys know, my, my oldest son when he was right before his third birthday. So for a while before I had my lovely almost 10 year old twins, I was a mother without a child, and that was a very strange uh, place to be in. Um, and I'm very lucky that I have a very su great support system, including uh, many strong females. And um, you know, my mother and my you know grandmother, my aunts, my sister-in-laws, you know, everybody, cousins, friends. Um, you know, that's how really that really what helped me get through that period. Um, and, and I guess my foundation has been um, having strong females in my life. Um, when I was a kid, we had, my father had two sisters, neither one of them, one of them was married, but neither one of them had children. And my cousins and I used to go out, they, they, my, they lived on a farm in New Jersey and my cousins and I used to spend weeks at a time there. So these aunts were really mothers to us for that time. And we, I had so much fun. Um, so I had that as a foundation. And, and now I'm very lucky that my children have, um, you know, an, a couple of, you know, my aunt, my sister-in-law, one sister-in-law is uh, single and she is a wonderful aunt and just really, loves to have one-on-one -on -one time with my kids. And I, and I, and I, I think that's really special. I think whenever you're treat, treating um, a child in a special way, you're, you're a nurturer and in many ways a mother. So I, I appreciate all the nurturers in my life. Thank you. Elke? Uh, well, to me, the theme, a mother, or just one another really serves to broaden the tent under which uh, the definition of motherhood is, is more all encompassing. Um, taking what has been 
considered more limiting and evolving it into something that is uh, limitless in the way we define what motherhood is. And I think that only serves to benefit us as a society. Uh, the more people that we can invite into our realm, the more enriched our lives are in general, which is uh, wonderful. Um, so when we don't limit our definition of what is motherhood, then we leave ourselves open for really powerful, vibrant connections with other women in our lives. Um, for me, I was raised by my grandparents. So my grandmother was um, my mother. And uh, for every Mother's Day, I would give her uh, two cards, uh, not just a Mother's Day card, but also a Grandmother's uh, Day card because uh, she served multiple roles within my life. And I am so incredibly grateful for not only her love and her guidance and her illumination, but all of the female relationships that I have in my life um, serve to provide some element of nurturing. And that seems to be a common thread with the comments that have come before. It really all circles back to nurturing. So ultimately, when we broaden that definition of what constitutes motherhood, we all are the better for it. Broaden that definition. That's awesome. Laura? Hi. Um, I'm joining today as a happy, single, middle-aged woman looking at the back 50 years of my life with a lot of optimism and a lot of enthusiasm. And it's very interesting because when I was asked to do this and to join, and I was so happy to be able to connect with my, my former classmates, as I'll call them, um, one word that struck me was spinster. And I had to laugh because I use a lot of humor in my life to get through things. And I just I laughed at the, at the fact that it's just such an antiquated word. So I happened to look it up. And the definition of spinster is literally unattached, free, single, an unmarried woman, typically older. And in the dictionary or Wikipedia, it literally says the antithesis of this is bachelor. Oh well, boy, that sounds better. I mean, bachelor connotates partying and fun and travel and single and all the spinster. So I in no way feel like a spinster. I know that there's others out there that may be a single. Um, I recently, due to COVID, moved in with my 80-year-old mother. So unmarried, no kids, 80-year-old mother. I look forward to uh, traveling with a man in my life, uh, moving on, um, new adventures. And I think even a, a decade or so ago, that might have been a, a, a terrible outcome. That word would have meant something just awful to people. So I get excited excited about the idea that um, it's an unrealistic standard to live up to, and there's a lot of joy in the positive connotations we can create for ourselves. So I'm happy to join this discussion. I think that's great. Mary, what do you have to share on that end? Mary? Oh, thank you. Hold on, she's on. Mary, you are on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Gee, I said such a great open sentence. Now I forgot it. But no, I said, I said I'm so happy to be here with this great group of women, the sisterhood. Um, it personally resonates with me in this regard that we are all mothers at heart. There are so many times that we are called upon to use our motherly instincts. And I believe that God has gifted us gifted us all with these instincts, that we have them inborn. And we're gifted with a, a mother's heart. So in essence, we're all connected by that unconditional spirit of love and charity, a charitable heart. I find that a, a mother's heart is so unique and charitable and giving. That unconditional love of, of faith. So to be on this call, to, to hear all these beautiful souls speak about 
what it is to, to be a mother. I'm not a mother, but I'm a stepmother and a step-grandmother, really. But I think we all are, at some level, mothers at heart. So thank you for having me. Thank you. I agree. Kim, you're on. Good evening, ladies. Uh, thanks, Halima, for the introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here with you ladies to listen and to understand. Uh, Y'all practically said everything, the word nurturing. Uh, the whole theme is uh, beautiful because motherhood is uh, it's really beautiful and it's a lovely thing, but it's really comp it's, it's so many complexities to the, the whole motherhood thing. So the title is befitting, especially in the, the time and the age that we live in now, where women are really, you know, evolving. You know, be, being being a mother is one thing, but you can be a mother in so many other things. And even if you aren't a mother, you can aid and assist your, you know, your sisters. So um, you ladies summed it up. Uh, I'm looking forward to all the questioning and in in the program. So. Beautiful title. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. You know, I am um, gonna give it to some of this feedback. There we go. Um, you know, I just I took a few takeaways from this, and you know, the number one word, as we said, is nurture, nurture. Um, and as Mary mentioned earlier, that we are connected by that unconditional heart and on that that love that connects us, and even for those mothers or women who decide not to be mothers, there's still that something in us that allows us to be that supportive person in another person's life. So, which leads to the next question. Motherhood, just something simple as the word motherhood, much more than simple. So I want you all to define what is motherhood? And we're gonna start with you, Kim. You're back on. <laughs> Oh, yeah, like I uh, stated in the introduction, uh, motherhood is, is, is complex, you know. It's a nurturing thing. It doesn't come with a whole lot of uh, instruction. It, it, it's, a, it's a task to really, really, to really be a mother. It's the most beautiful thing uh, in the world. And... To have support when you you are a mother, because you know people look to mothers as superheroes, you know, which I I never liked the title of being uh, the superwoman thing. I never liked that title, you know, because sometimes you know we just need a break. I mean, we love what we do and we understand what we do, you know. Especially I, my hat goes off to women who have five and six children because you have five or six little people that you have to understand. It's not no one size fit all, because I have two. And what I did with one and they 10 years apart didn't work with the, the, the next one. It didn't work like that, you know. So motherhood is a, a, a complex uh, thing for me, and, but, it, but it's also beautiful. So that's my definition of motherhood, <laughs> the complexities of it. I totally agree. <laughs> Mary, how would you like to chime in on that? To me, maybe I, I gather some of my definition of mother from my own mom. Um, to me, a mother is a teacher of love in the school of life, leading by example, educating her children, giving them various responsibilities, and helping them to develop their self-worth letting them explore and create their own identity. A mother is also a spiritual guide, gently guiding her children with faith and hope, kindness, of course, and compassion is a big one, honesty, respectfulness, tolerance, patience and honesty, and that unconditional love all the while instilling these lifelong traits into their character by being those traits that she hopes to develop in her child 
so they can go on to become productive members of society. A mother is a great blessing for this planet. And I hope as my mom is looking down from heaven that she will be proud of her children and the character traits that she developed, helped to develop in us as we become our own unique spirit. Thank you. That's my definition. Wow, I think I think you need to put Hallmark out of business, Mary. <laughs> that was that was really beautiful. Well, it's easy, it's easy to speak from your heart, you know, and when you think about your mom and when your mom has passed on and you're only touching back to uh, memories and traditions. Mothers are great with traditions at mm -hmm. holidays. That's where you do. You hold on to those things and they become an important fabric woven <laughs> into your own life. So, totally great. Laura? That was wonderful, Mary. And it's so interesting how we come from such diverse backgrounds in our experiences. And I want to also invite the guests at the end during the Q&A, if you resonate with any of our stories and have shared experiences that are similar, please please share with us. Um, again, I've enjoyed a real unorthodox, untraditional life when it comes to motherhood because I have a mother, but I haven't had children. So to Mary's point, at some point I will lose my mother, probably in the coming years. Um, and what will Mother's Day look like to me without a mother and without being a mother? And I intend to continue to celebrate her even in her past life and as I move on with her memory. Um, but you know, as a mother, really that definition to protect and tend and pamper and raise and rear, you know, I think I've, I've practiced doing that all my life with my friendships and my, in my work life and in my chosen work. Um, so for this generation, I think it's open for course correction. I think there's a lot of joy if you can apply those words, those terms, to the other things in your life that apply to mothering. Hey, I, I um, totally agree with everything you ladies are saying. I think Elizabeth, you're next. Um. I really don't know how to tap <laughs> that. I wish I had gone first. Um, but I honestly, I mean, I agree with everybody, the nurturing, the complexities. Um, again, I was very, very lucky to have such a, a solid background and foundation and very lucky that uh, most of my relatives lived very close together. So we just, there was a lot of things that I took for granted, I guess, you know, growing up and hearing other people's life stories and, and thinking that, wow, everybody didn't have what I did. And um, so I, again, and the challenges then that I've had as an adult, I've been able to get through because of, of my foundation. Um, but one, one commercial that um, I just think, just when you say, ask about defining motherhood, I don't know if this is, I'm guessing it's national. Um, there's a commercial about um, adopting teenagers. And it is, like I wait for this commercial to come on. It's just, it's this, it's this woman and she's, you know, sitting there with a teenage daughter and the daughter is getting, is very upset and saying, you know, she had just broken up with her boyfriend and, you know, and they're having a conversation and then the daughter says, you know, I'm, you know, he, I'm tagged, you know, he, he's tagged in all these photos or whatever, however she said it. So this woman says, oh, well, we'll, I'll cut them out. And she's thinking, she's talking about a piece of tags on a piece of clothing and the teen laughs and they hug. And it just is so, to me, such a great example of the, you don't need experience to be a mother. You just need that love and wanting to nurture someone. And I, I really, I just love this commercial because I really think it really puts it all into one, you know, tight little, you know, bow. So that would, but I have to say. <laughs> Linda? Motherhood. Um, I think that it's probably been the hardest thing I have ever, uh, that I've ever done in my life. Uh, I was a single parent and I had, uh, I have two daughters and a son. 
and each one of them were so different. And I just never felt quite um, worthy of being their mother, um, that here I had these little souls that I was totally responsible for, uh, for, for making them happy, uh, from wiping their tears to feeding them, clothing them, um, really nurturing them. And so I, I would just look at them sometimes and they would just be playing or doing something so innocent. And, and I would just think, what am I gonna do? How do I do this? When do I do this? When do I teach them things that they need to know? Like at that time we had to write checks for everything. When do I teach them about writing checks? And I can remember um, saying to them, listen, when you come home from school, because at that time, all they wanted to do was go outside and play when they got out of school. So I said, when you come home from school, you check everything. You make sure the water's running. You make sure we have lights. And if nothing, if something is not working, you call me and let me know. And so I remember one day I was in a meeting. And when I came out, my colleague said, um, your, your children call. I said, oh, OK. And she said, um, they said they were going outside to play. And so I said, oh, OK. She said, um, they said that they don't have any lights. Your lights are off. And I thought, oh, my god. They told her. And so and she didn't know how to tell me. And of course, you know, you just try to work those things out. But when I look at all of it, um, all of it makes you the mother all of it, their trust in you, um, the guidance that you provide, and I'm back to nurturing. And all of that becomes motherhood. You have to figure out, how do I make this work? How, how, do, I, how do I make sure that the lights get back on? Because we have to have, you know, it's, um, it was interesting uh, being a single parent and and feeling like I just had the weight. I didn't know what to do with these children. We had a meeting, a family meeting every Friday. So we could kind of talk about uh, what had happened. I could look at them uh, and look in their faces and I could see if somebody was in trouble going through something. And so um, motherhood is, is just figuring it out, uh, following your instincts and just figuring out how to make it work. I didn't feel I was much older than they were. And so we kind of grew up together, but um, uh, it turned out well. They're all very happy and healthy uh, young adults and now have their own families. And most of them, some of them, my oldest daughter doesn't have any children, but she is the greatest auntie. Uh, to hear them tell it. She is the greatest auntie and she is a very caring and very nurturing person. So I think that would be my overall definition of motherhood. Well, I think that's an excellent definition of motherhood. And that leaves us to you, Elkie. Okay, well, uh, since I am not a mother, uh, my definition of motherhood has to be based on observation. So here it is. Uh, just as our other panelists have uh, spoken to, um, motherhood is an incredibly multifaceted role. And when I consider mother motherhood, to me, the ultimate role of motherhood is to provide your children with a toolbox for them to be able to build their lives. So I implore all young mothers or those who are um, have children who are, are still in their formative years, be careful and mindful of what you put in that toolbox because it will govern the trajectory of your child's life and will either have them prepared or have them 
um, in a state of disarray with how they are able to tackle the challenges that they will confront in their life. Uh, the toolbox is everything. Um, so I, I feel that that is a mother's most important role to give their child the toolbox by which they build their lives. And um, it, I, it can't be stressed enough what a vital role that is for the development of a child. And I really am just in awe of just how much of a role a mother has in uh, ultimately paving the path for their children. And uh, I'm so very grateful for all of the mothers who really understand their role in building their child's toolbox. Wow. You know, um, everyone had such great responses. And, you know, once again, I grabbed a few nuggets. You know, this, that whole toolbox thing is so true, Elke. And even when Mary mentioned about teachers of love in the school of life, and that is so true. You know, I'm, I was great. I'm blessed to have been raised by a wonderful woman who would have been 96 if she were alive. But she also had my father who was who was a wonderful father. Um, and I always speak, you know, I don't even like speaking to my parents in the past. I like to speak with them in the present because they are still present in my life. With When I look at the different things that we go through in life and I say, how would mama have done that? You know, you know what would she have done? And so that toolbox is, is so correct. And you, it is not a one size fit all situation because every child is different. Both of my boys are 11 years apart, 31 and 20, you know? 11 years later, ooh, I must have been crazy, but it happens, you know, and, you know, they're two different young men with, with different platform, different trajectories, but it's all in how you raise your kids. So I agree with everything you ladies say. So let's go on to question number three. I'm going to throw something out there. We all know that some women, um, we know some women who are called mothers in our society don't function as such. They gave birth to another human being, which is no small feat, but then failed to provide the well-being that their child so desperately needed. And, you know, unfortunately, we know several people like that. But at the same time, there exists many women who do not carry the common designation of mother, who function as the life-giving source of love, encouragement, joyfulness, and empathy in the lives of many. So that's why we do ourselves a disservice on Mother's Day at times by only honoring those women who have earned their title through childbirth. So why isn't motherhood, you know, let's go back to that one size fit all. Why isn't motherhood a one size fits all situation for some women? And Laura, I'd like to start with you. And uh, first of all, I also want to sort of connect with some of the comments that are being said here. I, I absolutely love that commercial, um, Elizabeth. I know exactly what you're talking about. And it really speaks to the fact that there's there's no instruction book, like Kim said. And there really just needs to be love. There, there's no, you just have to be present and you have to be willing to, to, to be in that position. So I love that commercial. Um, you know, it's funny. I um, think that basically it's about how you decide to feel each year. The, the fact that this is an out of the box, not a cookie cutter type solution, um, one size fits all thing. I have to share, I, um, my boyfriend and I, he, we both sold our houses and everything going on with COVID. We had no TV, no radio, nothing for about six months and we decided to play board games. So what do we play? The game of life. And I don't know how familiar you are with the game of life or anybody listening in today, but it's a pretty traditional game, except you look at the board and the board has certain paths and the path is to get a job and to get married. And you've got a little plastic car and the pink pet is, peg is for the girl and the blue peg is for the boy. So you've got your pink peg, or I would, let's say I'm driving around in my life, my game of life, and I meet the man and that's the blue peg. And then you got children that are blue and pink. And I thought, my God, this thing is, is so outdated. First of all, what if it was two pink pegs? What if it was a lesbian couple that wanted to adopt the child? Maybe the board has to be revamped. The board should say, pandemic up ahead, COVID, Black Lives Matter. I mean, our lives look so different today. So this cookie cutter out of the box thought process 
hit me again, just like my example in the beginning of the spinster thing. You know, I just think that there's no one size fits all. And, and the definition needs to change and morph and evolve as we are as people. And I'm so glad that there are more options for people and that you could be adopted. You could be adopted by a same sex marriage by yourself. I was divorced at 37 years old and I had people literally coming to me saying, Laura, this is it. If you're going to do it, do it by yourself. And at that time, and it was only, you know, 18, 19 years ago, but that was enough time where I really didn't think I could do that on my own. Now I think looking back, I might've done it just because the world has changed so much and the thought process behind it has changed. So that's just an interesting thought and take from, again, the single woman without the kids, the aunt, and living it a little bit differently. <coughs> That's a great response. You know, I was going to go to Elkie next, but I think maybe her internet um, knocked her off. So I will skip and go straight to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, you're on mute. I'm on mute. There I am. Um, you know, I think... Um, I, I think I've said a lot of, of, of what my heart says, but um, I, I, you know, uh, Laura, I actually, in my notes, I wrote this to, down too, because I, before I met my husband, I, I have always wanted to be a mother. So to me, I knew that, you know, I had started the process. I started to look into adoption, what kind of options, um, and it was funny because, um, uh, one of my best friends lives in Russia. And when I told her that I wanted to adopt, she said, okay, well, you could come stay here for a while and then you can go back and then you'll, it'll be like your, it's your child, you know, it was that, and I, and I didn't understand what she was saying. And then I realized in her mind and a, a cultural thing, there was a stigma of um, of adopting. I mean, not having it your biological child. And, and I said, I wouldn't want to hide that. I'd be proud of that. Um, but it, it's interesting that uh, different cultures think different things. But yeah, I had always, that to me, that was, that was not even going to be an issue. I was going to adopt you know, I, I was already looking into, you know, in my mind, the back of my mind, thinking of all, you know, different male uh, gay friends <laughs> that I knew of that. I thought, huh, I wonder if they want to be a parent because I could totally co-parent with them. Um, so I, you know, it was just always something I had, had, had thought about for me, but shouldn't be for everybody and it isn't for anybody. So um, that's my experience. Lima, you're muted now. <laughs> Me? Or who? <laughs> Just saying, that was an awesome experience. Yes. I I, got uh, back. What's that, Laura? We got Elkie back. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give her a, a chance to unwind, and I'm going to go straight to Mary, and then I'll come back to Elkie. Mary? And you're on mute. We lock that mute, don't we? Is that good? Yep. Okay. Motherhood certainly is not a one-size-fits-all category for sure because motherhood can occur in many different forms, many different roles, biological mother and adoptive mother, stepmother, foster care mother, uh, single mom, spiritual mother, grandmother, or a special aunt or sister. We all have an opportunity to play a part in this vital role of helping another person develop and and move on with, with life. So to, to me, because we are all so unique in our approach and what we think about and how we are um, realizing that each part we play is very special and long lasting. We make a long lasting impression upon that that person that soul um to to me motherhood really is a, a journey that cannot be um predetermined only experienced and everyone's experience can be vastly different but that common thread that connect us is of course as we said love and nurturing so it's not a one-size-fits-all and i'm very happy that it isn't 
because it makes life beautiful, unique, and precious. Back to you, Lima. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Well, actually, back to Elke. <laughs> Deepness. Okay, my apologies <laughs> because, yes, technical difficulties. That wasn't embarrassing at all. And I can't promise that that won't happen again. The wonders of the internet. So I'm going to have to ask you, Halima, if you could repeat, you don't have to repeat the whole thing, but what is the, the core of the question I'm answering? Sure. I was saying, why isn't motherhood a one size fits all situation for some women? Uh, it isn't a one size fits all situation because it is really dependent upon everyone's unique situation. Um, everything is about context. And I think it's a good thing that as a society, we've evolved from uh, the way it was probably 50, 60 years ago, where at that time, the definition of motherhood was very linear and very uh, restrictive. And so a lot of people were left out of that loop. And I think that any time in our society when we attempt to uh, provide a very limiting construct for what is motherhood, then as a society, we suffer. So I think as the years have gone on as a society, in many aspects, we have progressed. And now we understand that um, motherhood isn't one size fits all. As I mentioned earlier uh, in the broadcast, I was raised by my grandparents. And uh, specifically, my grandmother had an incredibly influential um, impact on my life and uh, how I came to be who I am today. Um, I'm grateful she's still here with us. She's 93 years old and in December she'll be 94. And um, I just feel that when we, when we don't impose such restrictive and limiting definitions for our roles in society, it opens us up to greater possibilities for connection with one another. And motherhood is certainly under that umbrella. And that's my perspective on it. Wow. Linda. I don't want to come behind Elfie. <laughs> <laughs> I know everyone will come behind Elke because she she, she always wraps it up way that to <laughs> say things that just sums it up. So, yeah. um, so I I will just add that um, no, uh, there's no way that motherhood can be a one size. Uh, my oldest daughter totally did not prepare me for the two that came after her. Because, you know, you, you have one and you just think, okay, this child is, you know, I, I thought she was um, perfect. She was sweet. She just loved me. And then these two <laughs> rowdy kind of totally different than she. So there's no way I could use what I had with her for them. So there was no no there's no cookie cutter there there's no one size fit all it it is trial and error with each one and then there then there the the grandchildren who you are mother to but it's your grandchild so you're different with them um, because the things that um, I, I remember I would I had six grandchildren I have a little one now um, that uh, one year this month and and then I have the the others, and so there are six of them, and I would get them, and we would go hang out all day, and then we'd go home, and we would drink Kool Aid out of stem glasses, and that was our time. <laughs> we would 
just toast and have such a grand time. And so I en actually enjoyed um, mothering and nurturing my grandchildren because I, I didn't feel that I was, I guess I was more relaxed when the grandchildren came along than I was with my own children because they say, put that glass down, put that glass down. Do you never let us do that? Well, you know, by the time they came along, ah, what's the point, you know? So um, I, that, I, that's uh, what I feel. I don't believe there there is any uh, cookie cutter situation. Life is different. People change. Uh, everything is very different now than than it was. And so we just have to accept it. And as you say, keep it moving. So yeah, that's what I say. Yep, you can say that again. That's my favorite line. Keep it moving. And we're gonna keep it moving to K I M keep it moving, Kim Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies. Um on that note with that, well I started off when we opened up about there there's no one size fit all to being uh a mother, a motherhood. But for me, uh, I was a very young mother uh, with my first. So I kind of like never, I'm not going to say never wanted children. I was really young. So I was like, what, what was I to do? So I had the baby, right? I had very, uh, I had a great support system. Beautiful. I didn't, you know, I graduated uh, high school because I got pregnant in high school. But again, I didn't have really motherly instinct at all. Was I a good mother? Yes, because I guess I was kind of like in survival mode. They were mine, they came from me. I was gonna do the, the best that I could do to give them the tools as Elke said, you know, they were mine. So I wanted to do what I had to do and I needed to do. I could have left them with my grandmother, but I didn't, because you know, back then, well, in you know the black community in New Orleans in the South, grandmothers, if you were in a certain situation, they would take over your kids. I wasn't having it. I wanted to raise my own kids, so I did. So moving forward, I have a friend. We're very, very, very close. She, uh, she's a lawyer. She's in law law enforcement. She always said she didn't want to have kids. And I used to think that was kind of insane at that time. Now, mind you, we were very young, 27 when I had my second daughter. And I used to say, now, why she don't want any children? And every time I would have my daughter, she would say, well, if you want, if you're not, if you're bringing your baby, um, I'm not coming with you. I'll catch you on a rebound. I was like, OK. But as I got older and I studied her, I was like, I understood. Now, mind you, she was very, very motherly because after my daughter, after Khadija, she loved both of my children, but she just didn't have a tolerance for them when they was little. And I just used to think she didn't like my children, but it wasn't that. She just didn't want to be bothered with kids. And she was way more motherly than me because I didn't show a lot of, you know, affection. My kids got everything they needed and they wanted, but. I didn't get very motherly till I got older, you know, I guess. So again, with the question being one, si uh, one size fit all, it, it, it just doesn't, you know, again, like I say, motherhood is a very, very complex uh, situation to me, but it's all done in, in love. Now, recently, within the last year, they had a lady, we used to go to these meetings, and she tapped me on my shoulder. She said, Kim, I have a situation for you. She said, would you mind watching my son? Because she had to travel. I was like, me? Now, mind you, my kids are grown. I don't be, I didn't be bothered with any kids after that. I raised my own. Again, and kids love me. You know, I guess I was always very, very stern, but they love me. I guess my spirit was always nice, but I wasn't one to go to baby showers or any of that kind of stuff. But again, I'm still a loving person. So the lady said, would you watch my kid for me? I was like, well, how old is he? You know, do I have to cook? Do I have to do that? She said, no, he's 14. I just have to travel. And I guess she just paid attention to me. And I guess people must have referred us. So I say, yeah, I'll watch him. So I was like a sitter. I stayed in the house and I watched him. He was a very humble kid, raised right, had two parents, everything. But they used to have to go to these meetings. 
And again, the, my motherly instinct just kicked in. Now this coming from a person who don't do kids. Now mind you, he wasn't an infant, but still he was a child, you know, and I had to bring him to school because I worked down the street from where she lived. So, you know, down in the downtown area. So it all worked out well. So with that being said, it's, it's not, sometimes it takes a while for a mother to become motherly, even though she's doing everything that she's supposed to be doing as a mother, it still takes a while for some to become motherly, as Linda said. And now I have a grandson and my daughter always tell me, wow, you really, really love him. Well, I love y'all too. You know, it just took a, a while to show that, you know, affection for me. So again, uh, that's my take on this little one size fit all situation for a mother. Well, that that is so true. You know, I um, I I, I became a mother at twenty one. I was still in college. Um, I was still in college, and I just pledged my sorority, and I was like, uh oh, you know. And I was afraid to tell my my, my parents because you know I'm the baby girl, Miss Goody Two Shoes. Um, I didn't even know how to cook. You know, I was like, cook now. I'm like, how do I don't know how to cook right? Sandwiches and soup. That was it. And um, you know, when I think about it. It, you're right. It took a while for those motherly instincts to, to happen. And I was so grateful that my mom was around, you know, when, when Johnny was born. But then as time gone on, I was like, oh, OK, I, I understand. But it was still challenging. It was still challenging because you want to make sure that you're doing what you need to do to nurture that child, to raise that child. And then you want to make sure that you set an example, not just for that child, but for the other children. Next thing you know, all the little kids wanted to come by our house. You know, a lot of people would have always looked at me as being so corporate, like, she a mama? Yeah, I'm a mama that cook, clean, wash dishes, cook 24-7, stay up until 4 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, you just make these things happen. But like Linda said earlier with grandchildren, it's a different, it's a different kind of vibe, you know? It's like we know we can give them back, but at the same time, we love them all the same. But with those grandchildren, it's like you forget that your children were children, and you're like, oh, I don't remember him doing stuff like that. Oh, look, he's got the cell phone. He's calling somebody. We had no cell phones back then. These kids in this generation, they can write a book at a year old, okay? And so it's a, it's a totally different atmosphere. So everything you ladies said is so true. Okay, so I am gonna go on to the fourth question. So. It's more like a statement and I want you guys, you ladies to chime in. So one of the things I would like to point out is that um, we do recognize that some women are not mothers. We, you know, we talked about that earlier and they're not mothers for many different reasons, fertility issues or no desire. They don't feel like they're motherly and have no interest in having children. Uh, someone has been abused in some form or fashion and feel that their lack of love from their biological mother may have affected them in some kind of way, or maybe just whatever that issue may be. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, who are we to judge? You know, we like Elke mentioned earlier, times have changed, circumstances have changed. You know, some people look at single women once upon a time as like that was a mark on us, or you don't have any children, but everybody's different. And we support one another. You know, one of the things that I know we were offline talking, um, you know, there are so many different labels now. You've got the daddy daughter dance and you've got, you know, um, a son. The father's not around for whatever that reason may be. Maybe the father's incarcerated and another man has to come in and take that child. You know, let's let's have that conversation, especially with some of us who once upon a time were single and we were raising young men in our lives you know, or young women, how do you deal with telling that daughter, you know, that, you know, your daddy can't take you to the father daughter dance, but you had that uncle or whomever. Elke, let's start with you. Well, as someone who was raised in a somewhat non-traditional environment, um, my life with my grandparents uh, within the cocoon of our home felt, you know, pretty normal to me as a kid because I didn't know anything else. Um, it was only when I ventured 
outside to the outside world, going to school or in social settings, and my grandparents were with me, that things became somewhat awkward. Uh, not awkward for me necessarily, but there was an awkwardness projected onto me from either fellow schoolmates who had parents and didn't necessarily understand the concept of grandparents raising children as opposed to parents. So sometimes I get the awkward question, oh, who's your grandparents or where are your parents? Or, um, and sometimes I uh, would get those types of questions from adults, uh, which, you know, they should have known better, but uh, you, get, you get those questions, you field those questions, um, and that's when you realize, oh, this is not quote unquote normal. Um, and, uh, but I, in some ways it, it, it affected me when I was very little, like when you have grandparents, they can't often do the types of physical activities with you that a parent could. And because of that, I never learned how to ride a bicycle. And so because I did not have a parent there to teach me how to ride a bicycle. Um, and so you don't, sometimes parents, you know, play with their kids with toys. Yeah, my grandparents didn't do that. However, my <laughs> grandmother did teach me how to play badminton. She set up a net in the front yard um, and about twice a month we would go out and play badminton. Um, I wish that could come in handy for my future country club life, but apparently I'm not there yet. But my point is that the non-traditional structure, um, depending upon the environment, can be um, a positive or a negative. However, I was also fortunate to have other families in uh, other family members rather uh, who were a part of my life, including my mother. And um, so I didn't have to rely solely on two elderly people and their life perspective. I was able to also get support from um, my mother and my aunts. And, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful because it provided a truly well-rounded experience for me that I don't think a lot of kids uh, have. So I, I feel uh, very fortunate to have had the experience that I did growing up. Well, once again, she has answered that with such eloquence. And after the show, we're going to all start a badminton club at our own country club. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next on the list? Laura, you're next. That was beautiful, Elkie. And I think I'm really enjoying understanding. Uh, we're getting to know each other and reconnecting like this. And they're just they're beautiful stories. And I love that the, the positivity, somebody could have turned that story into something really dark, Elkie, and you, you took away the good parts. And I'm sure you've had moments when you were younger that you didn't understand, but it, it's so interesting. I mean, I'm an aunt. I've been a role model and a mentor to many of my friends' kids. There's a certain level of perspective that comes with that that's been wonderful when these teenagers can't talk to their parents so to speak, directly, so they'll come to me. And I love when my friends that are the parents say, Laura, we trust you as Aunt Laura. We know you're going to do it with humor. We know you're going to be direct. They're going to earn your confidence. And if it's really something awful that they're telling you, that you will share it with us if it's, if it's dangerous, but otherwise you will be their mentor and their secret keeper. Um, so it's it's been great to be able to hold that, um, you know, and, and, and to be a part of someone's life and have a sh share a place in their lives. A uh, case in point, my friend Marissa, um, her two daughters, one of them had given me this little bracelet. I found it today and I thought I have to show this online. It basically there's she made it. It's three beads and the beads represent sister, aunt and friend. And she gave it to me a couple of years ago and I just cherish it. And I, in fact, it recently broke, which is why I pulled it out to fix it today because COVID, who's wearing jewelry? Um, but I have all these little mementos and pieces. And then I see Elizabeth with her artwork behind her. Like, you know, those things were always reserved only for mothers. And yet I've gotten beautiful little mementos and pieces. And, you know, I know there's, there's a grandparents day. There's a mother's day. There's a father's day. There's no aunt and uncle day. We're kind of a lost entity, but there doesn't need to be. I think that 
it's so beautiful when a child steps up to just offer you a, a a thanks in some way, one that you weren't looking for, just simply because you were another ear, another mentor, and you had a place in their life. So I, I found that to be very rewarding. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. Mary, what type of wisdom do you have for us today on this question? <laughs> well, I really appreciate what Laura and Elke had to share. You know, um, not being a mom, and of course, uh, that would make me never a single mom, but my, my niece was a single mom by definition, but she certainly wasn't a single mom in, in her responsibilities to her daughter because we all gather around as a, a family. She, had, she has three sisters and a, a whole lot of aunts. So we all really helped and played a part in um, helping her care for her daughter. It was interesting to watch my, my sister, because her daughter was young when she had her granddaughter. So my sister was really kind of mother and grandmother to the daughter, helping her daughter learn how to be a mom. You know, we were all there uh, to help her financially, emotionally. You know, you're stepping into this role, being almost a, a young person yourself. And um, I was just saying to my sister the other day that uh, my niece, and now my great niece, she's 29 years old now. So we're going back 29 years when we all gathered around helping my niece, uh, being a single mom. One thing I, I, I take away from the experience of that, watching all of this take place is um, the role that you have as an aunt, a great aunt and an aunt and how you can inspire and really give them some kind of uh, advice that sometimes they won't go to their own mother for, you know, they have a, a secret or a story or this is going on in life. So it was really a privilege to help my niece when she became a single mom, to help her uh, find her way around that. And for all of us to uh, come together as a family and collectively help her become the great mother that she did become. And to see how her daughter turned out. She lives in New York City. She has a great job. She's living a wonderful life. And I like to think that we all had a part in that. So that would be my, my observation. Um, I think uh, one thing is important being a single mom is that you know that you have family and friends out there to support you. And to ask for that help if you should need it, that advice, that wisdom. Hey, can you babysit? Or you know, I might need a little help financially to, to know that helps, uh, it would be extremely comforting to know that a, a friend or a family member is only a phone call away. And that's kind of how we did it. And now I look back over the years, I'm giving my age away. I mean, my great niece is a 29 years old, geez. But um, it was a, a beautiful time. I look at it as a beautiful time and I look at her, uh, her mom still being a single mom and the challenges she faced and how she came through that beautifully and uh, created another soul that is out there uh, making the world, world a little brighter. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, appreciate it. Kim. Um, I'm a piggyback off of uh, the story Elkie shared. I too, uh, my grandmother raised me. My mother was in my life, but um, God bless her soul. My grandmother do get the mother, mother of my life award, you know, thanking my mother for bringing me to this world. But um, it's very, uh, I'm just, I had a moment, I'm thinking, <laughs> thinking about my grandmother. You know, coming up, I too, I, I loved my grandmother dearly. And sometimes, you know, I would have a lot of moments because again, my grandmother was an older lady as well. And in, in the South, you know, that was very much, um, it was a thing. A lot of grandmothers raised uh, a lot of kids for whatever reasons. 
But sometimes I wasn't ashamed. I love my grandmother, but all the kids at my school, their parents were very, you know, they were young. And, you know, I have my grandparents and my grandmother. She was very supportive. She would always come. My grandfather, he was a very quiet, quiet, passive man. He he didn't come around much, but he loved me dearly as well. So her raising me, and when I did have kids, and I guess by my mother not uh, raising me, that's why I wanted to be this. I never liked, like I said, never liked the superwoman role, but I was just trying to be this, this, the best mother that I could be, you know, with what I was showing, you know, all the affection. So again, it's it's a lot when another parent, when another human come into your life and raise you who's not biological. Cause I mean, that had to be a lot for her. I was the first grandchild. She never raised me, never said, I'm your mama. And I wasn't raised that way. I knew that was my grandmother and I knew who my mama was. Again, and I used to call my mama by her first name and that was that was weird too. And now I see people, but I knew that was my mother, but coming up in the house, my grandmother, she would never say, go tell your mama. She would always say, go tell Marguerite. So it wasn't out of disrespect. That's how I was raised, you know, that's how I was raised. He would always say, go tell Marguerite this or go tell Marguerite that. She never felt bad about it. That's just how it was at the time. So, again, I respect anybody who jump in or who take step in and uh, take on that role of being a mother. You know when they need to be. You know we all need to help one another. You know, especially your family. You you need to. You got to have that guiding force because who wants to be in foster care? You know when somebody could take the lead and, you know, raise the kid. You know, it doesn't have to be your biological kid to be a mother. So that's my take on it. Well, that's a good take on it. We, um, we're gonna take, um, we're gonna do Linda and Elizabeth because we have two questions so far from our audience. So Linda and Elizabeth, um, go ahead and, and respond to, to the question and then we're gonna take the two questions that we have from our audience. Well, I don't know that there, there's um, 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 a lot to say <laughs> after everybody speaks so eloquently about it. Um, but uh, I, I've said I've said before I, I was a single parent, and um, and that's for many years. And my youngest daughter was not even walking, um, um, and so you do have to rely on help from other people. I, I remember uh, I just gotten a job and I needed to go. We, I'm from North Carolina. I needed to go to Atlanta for training. That would have been the first time I was ever away from my children. And I didn't have one person that could take them. So I had to separate them, to send one with them, one sister and one with another sister. And and um, another one with another sister. And that was the first time they had ever been away from each other also. So it was difficult, but it was, I felt good that I had someone um, that was able to do that, that was able to help me uh, with that, to help take care of, um, of my of the children. I, being a single parent was very difficult, I can remember um, and my children um, wanted, especially my youngest daughter, wanted her dad in her life so much. And one time she came to me and she said, I wrote, I sent a letter to daddy. She said, how long does it take for a letter to come back from Philadelphia? And I felt so bad because I, I knew what that meant, that she was just there anxiously waiting, you know, for... Um, to get a, a response to the letter that she sent, and so it, it it was it was many times I found myself in situations where I just had no one no one to turn to. Uh, my parents were there, but they were elderly, and, and I, I had um, uh, six sisters. I think it was six, yeah. So I, there was um, five sisters and. And I had five sisters and two brothers. And the brothers were much younger. So I could not like rely on them if, to help my son because they were they were 
not much older themselves. And so, um, so it, it was, uh, I think it was a difficult time, but I have one sister that my children would felt comfortable and they would always go to her if they needed, if they wanted to, to talk about something that I guess they didn't feel comfortable talking to me about. Um, they loved her and uh, I was confident and I felt good that there was someone in their life that they could go to, like Laura. Laura is, the, is, is you know, the auntie that everybody wants. You know, you want an auntie like that, that you can go to, that you can talk about mom if you need to. You can share whatever you want to share with her. And you know that she's, she's going to be right there. She's going to comfort you. She's going to say to you exactly what needs to be said. And so, um, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's my, my, my take on that, uh, as we say, it takes a village to raise a child. So when you have people that you can turn to, um, all the better. So I think um, that's, that's what I would like to say about it. Thank you, Linda. Elizabeth? I have to say, Linda, I have written right here, I just wrote down, it takes a village. And before, when you were talking about this drinking the Kool-Aid out of the STEM glasses, my mom does that with my kids. It's usually like cranberry juice or something, but it's in these beautiful, you know, champagne flutes, you know, whatever. Meanwhile, I'm like, you know, little plastic glasses around here, you know, <laughs> nothing breakable. Um, but I think that it takes a village is, um, really an interesting um, concept nowadays, especially. Um, I'm very lucky. Um, we have a nice group of um, families in where I live that we, we all support each other. And we've each said to each other, look, if you ever see my kid doing anything wrong, I'm giving you permission to, you know, to, to discipline them um, because we look out for each other there's the other weird side now that's happening is it takes a village has gone um, over social media now. And it is a very strange um, thing. I mean, I'm, I'm on different, you know, um, parents, Facebook pages and some of the things that people feel that they can ask a, group of complete strangers is it's sad it really is sad I mean some I remember this one woman asked about you know her husband was thinking of having a vasectomy and she asked the whole group of mothers and you know of Long Island mothers and it tons of people other people will put pictures of, you know, their child has a rash and they'll put a picture on these. And it's just, that's, that's really not what we should be using this for. Um, on the flip side, um, the social media can be so incredibly wonderful. There's right now a mother right now who's struggling in our community with very, very, very serious health issues. And one of the other mothers started a GoFundMe site to help her family. And that's a great use of social media, but to use it to try to raise your child, taking advice from complete strangers is a really scary, scary, it takes a village kind of concept. That's it. Well, that's, that's more than it, that's, that's quite a bit. Thank you, ladies. I am going to go to um, the comments. As soon as I can figure out how to scroll up. Okay, here we go. And there are three questions now. So the first one, let me show it so you ladies can see it. It's from Angel Onye. Hey, Angel Onye. So she says, I feel single moms are made to feel they have to prove themselves as capable of raising children and being both parents, not as not just as a capable mother. It's not really a question, but it's, um, it's a statement. Um, who, who would like to, to comment on that? You know, two of you would be fine. I'll jump in. Okay, go um, ahead, Linda. 
I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why, why she feels that, um, um, you moved the question. I was kind of looking oh, okay. at the question. Let me, let me I was go back why, why she, you know, was wondering why she felt she needed to prove herself. Uh, I, as I said, I I was a single parent. Never did I feel I had to prove my. The only people that I felt that I had to prove myself or had any kind of responsibility to or for was my little people. Um, my children. I, I felt that I had to be just the best role model. Um, and as Elkie said, put together the best toolbox for them without even realizing or understanding that I was putting together a toolbox. But I didn't, I never felt that I had to prove anything to anybody and you shouldn't either. You, you, your responsibility is to your child or your children. And you just follow your instincts and you be the best mother, the best parent that you can be. So, so let me correct something. And she just put another message. That was actually um, not the question because there's a, I'm looking ab above. This is actually a question. She was just saying that some women feel that way, some women who are single. But here's mm -hmm. the real question. So today's women tend to be pushing to prove that we can do all that men do. So do you ladies believe that to be good or are we erasing what genuine motherly qualities we are given to prove ourselves are equal to men? I never felt equal, never tried to be equal. Um, uh, you cannot. I mean, there's so much that the mother can provide and there's so much that the father needs to provide to the children, whether they're boys or whether they're girls. I, I didn't feel that I was the father, even though with my son, I did uh, a lot of things that I felt I needed to do for him, like play baseball with him, throw, you know, throw the bat, keep him in sports. Um, things that I felt uh, that he lacked because we didn't, he, you know, there was no man in the house at that time. So um, I, I don't believe that, uh, I believe you have to be who you are. You have to, you're the mother. And and try as you might, you, you're not going to be the father. So I don't think that anything you do would uh, erase the motherly qualities uh, because we'll never be, we won't be equal. There's so much that they bring to the table and there's so much that we bring to the table. You just do the best you can. I agree. I'll just jump in real quickly. Um, you know, we, we will never be equal to men. Men will never be women and women will never be men, no matter how much sometimes we think we can. I, I know when we were offline, one of the things I've always said is that in certain communities, um, women during Mother's Day, during Father's Day will say Happy Father's Day. You know, I don't agree with that. I'm saying it openly to everyone. Some people may not agree, me, agree me, with me when I say that, um, but I, I totally disagree when a, a woman or a child or someone tells the to mother happy Father's Day. And I can understand why, because that's all that young man and young woman have seen growing up because the father wasn't around. But once again, there are some men in our communities um, in, who, or who may not be in your life at all, but a woman can never be a man. You know, Now we may be able to compete in certain marketplaces when it comes to corporate America. And a lot of that has changed over the years where you have women who are CEOs, women who are in the Marine Corps, the Army, or whatever that may be, and that's fine. But when you think about from a strength standpoint, that's like a woman can never be as strong as a man, no matter how much we try, no matter how much we think we can, we just, we are different in, in essence. And, you know, Linda, you mentioned earlier, there's nothing that we really have to prove because society and, and matters have changed so much over the years that we are constantly progressing. Now, they got some people who probably are still antiquated in their thinking, but it takes time. It takes time to, to be progressive and to move on. Laura, you want to say something? 
I just wanted to add quick, quickly, because I want to get too off track here, because I know we have a couple more questions, and we're, we're hitting the hour and a half, the hour and a half hour here. Um, I just to your point, I just think also that everyone has. She's right about women pushing themselves to be everything. I think in our society, it has gotten so off kilter as far as little girls being on the Boy Scouts and little girls being on the football team and little girls wanting to like. There's no lines in the sand for anything because we all are fighting so so hard to be equal with everything. I think that full circle is going to come come around where we're going to understand. Yes, we can be anything and we can do anything. But to your point, no, we really, there's certain things we can't be. Um, and to try to be everything is just exhausting and not fair to the mother or the father in this, in this case in point. So, um, you know, like we were saying way earlier, be the best person you can be, whether that's the mentor, the aunt, the mother, but to try to be a father or to try to be a father to a son, you know, I, I think that it stretches things to the limits. And I think that we need to be a little easier on ourselves as far as being all we can be and being what we what we should and can be for the moment. I agree. Kim, you want to say something? Yes. Um, to the question and to what Laura said, I think uh, women, especially, and I'm speaking for African-American Black women in our community, as Mother's Day, as fall, when Father's Day approaches in June, you know, you, you'll hear that and, it, and it's tiresome. I, I've had all kind of Facebook's debates. I don't do it anymore because it's exhausting. You know, I'm a, I'm I have to get myself something. Uh, you know, for Father's Day. You know, you're not a father. I mean, whatever role you took and if whatever happened in the uh, your significant other or he wasn't there, whatever. I get it. I get it. But I despise that term. I, I'm the mother and the father. No, you're not. And again, you never will be. You know, I know it can be kind of hard, you know, uh, to accept whatever your situation is, but, you know, don't do that trajectory for the children either to say that in front of kids, you know, I, and then some kids may feel, excuse me, some kids may, uh, may feel that way. But again, like Elke mentioned, you explain to your kids why what it is, you know, what, whatever the, the male was in your life or your husband, you explain to them, but you should never, you know, want to be Superman or become a Superman and a Superwoman. That's just ludicrous. That's crazy. That's crazy. And that type of thinking has to be deconstructed. It really does. Because you're a woman, you bore the child, yes, with the man help, but you're not a man. You never will be. Amen, sister. We have another question we're going to get to it um, because I, we are pretty much at our 7.30 mark. So this question is from Wayne Ali Nuruddin. Um, He says, such a wonderful program, truly heartwarming. I sincerely appreciate this enlightening conversation on so many levels. And the question is, what do you ladies consider to be the most rewarding aspect of today's experience on the show? Looking at these beautiful colors and all, and how beautiful we look in our beautiful essence. Anyway, I'm gonna let y'all answer. <laughs> I just, I think that it's that we come from such great difference back of the diversity among us, and that's our whole point here to connect in, in a in a world right now that's this that's about separation and or was this last year anyway. Just to be able to come together and be inclusive rather than reclusive or excluding. You know, we're celebrating our diversity in who we are in our culture, but we're also just celebrating our diversity in how we grew up. And look at all the different, whether raised by grandparents or a single mom, or in Mary's case, a stepmother, or two of us are, didn't have kids. It's just so interesting. I think the most rewarding part is that if anyone listening today can resonate with any part of what we're saying, then we did our we did our best to share and make that person feel more comfortable in their Mother's Day, their view of Mother's Day. I agree. Kim? This was a very powerful, uh, uplifting, and like I said, I came here to understand. And um, fortunately, I, I didn't disagree with anyone. I, I'm usually <laughs> disagreeing to some point, but you know, I, I understood where every each one of our views came from, and every one of them were uplifting, very, very uplifting. So this was a great, great program. And again, Elke, I want to give a shout out to you. You're such an eloquent speaker. You know, you should have a Toastmasters class. You could give me a few lessons. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
I want to say something to uh, all of the lovely ladies who participated on, on the panel today. Uh, first of all, thank you to Kim, very kind. But what I feel is uh, has been such an enriching experience participating in this panel is the diversity of experiences. Um, again, I'm not a mother. And so when passing along the link for this event to one of my dear friends and I told her what the subject matter was, she's like, well, what are you doing there? And I was like, well, yeah, and she's a mother. Um, so I said, well, you know, I, we're not just focusing on um, the very limiting silo of the classic definition of motherhood. I came from a mother and I'll have something, you know, hopefully substant substantive to offer, you know, fingers crossed. Um, so uh, I, it's been so wonderful to hear from you ladies uh, about your various experiences of things that I had never considered because I've never had that experience myself. But I think we, we all benefit from hearing one another's stories because they only broaden our perception of the world at large and expand our worldview. And at this uh, fractious time in our society, that is so very elemental. And that is my main takeaway from participating. And I'm really very appreciative of being allowed within this circle. Well, thank you. You know, I'm going to quickly chime in because we do have one more question. I do want to get to this question because it seems like this young lady really wants us to answer it. But one of the things that I love, first of all, I appreciate you all. And I'm looking at, at who we are at the table, um, the beauty of diversity. You know, we literally are in, at, uh, defining inclusivity. You know, so many people in so many places in the corporate spaces and other places are, this conversation is ongoing. But, you know, we're sisters, we're friends, we've all worked together. And just to, for the record, we are the ladies of HS Global Consulting. Um, and when these ladies and I, you know, these are ladies that I've worked with in the past and that we continue to work together now. And it's beautiful that, you know, sometimes women, we have a habit of being chatty chatty with just not going anywhere. But we have so much to offer and bring to the table. There's so much wisdom. You know, we're sitting here with each other, we're taking notes, I know I am. Um, because I'm really getting ready to put Elkie and Mary together to start the new Hallmark. We're going to call it something much differently. But these are some great nuggets, some great quotes that we can take away and use in our daily lives, not just for women, but men out there as well. I was just so, saying to Lima, literally I'm writing things down also, and this is our first time. We just really learned in this segment how we're playing off each other, how we relate to one another. And as we write down these little nuggets of wisdom, we could be diverse in verse. We could create a little creating card, you know, 12 card packages with our little, and I've got someone that can do the designs. I'm already typing with Lima. I will share the photos uh, with you all. Um, if we could all get on an email chain together, we'll go the next step with that. But for another time, our next venture. <laughs> exactly. We always have ventures. Elizabeth, we're going to um, have I'll just be really quick. Part. I'll just be really quick. I just really appreciate the create the creativity, the um, the positivity, but also that nobody's judging. I mean, I feel like I could talk about anything and I, I'm not going to be judged. I could ask questions that it just is a very um, uplifting experience. Thank you, Halima. No, thank you, ladies. I appreciate it. So here is a question from the lovely Epsetera Gobogali. Great points, last question, please. How do you go about a situation where you want your child's father in their life, but they don't want to and refuse to do so? How do you explain that to your child as they grow older? Or at what point do you accept it when you want a father figure in your life? Let's let's have two people to comment on that. Who, who, want, who want to be those? Who would like to answer that question? Keep looking at it. Well, I'll chime in for just a little bit because I can relate to what she is saying so much. Um, because I wanted my children's father in their life. 
I wanted it so much, but I had to take a step back and take a look at it and see if what I wanted would create value in his, in the in their life. And I had to take away, you know, I, I mean, I had to step back and take a serious look at that because I wanted it so much. But then I needed to make sure that having him in their life would be a would have a positive effect. And so when I realized that he wouldn't, um, then I I had to uh, figure out where do we go from here, because you you don't want to get what you ask for in a negative as you want him there, and then he bring. Uh, things into your child's life that you would not want them to be exposed to. So I think as they, you just have to explain to them, which is what I had to do. Um, and, and, as, and, and keep the, uh, as much positivity as you can. That's what I did. That was what I had to do with my children because their father was not in their life. Um, so now, um, now he wants to be in their life. And so now, you know, it, it doesn't matter to them. So I, I think that um, you say, at what point do you accept it? Now, if he refuses to be in the child's life, then you have to do other things with that, with the child to uh, give them some sense of settlement. Mm. Um, that, that's what I, that, that would be my, that would be my suggestion to you is that you, if he doesn't want to be a part of their life, then it's his loss. It's mm -hmm. definitely his loss. That's a, um, a tough question, I know. And I'll take it from one more person if you want to. But, you know, that's one, one of the things that I've always believed in is if, if something is going on between uh, ex-wife and an ex-husband or ex-boyfriend or whomever, you know, my thing is do your best to hold your tongue and not tell that child anything bad about his father or his mother. And I know I can be difficult because there are a lot of things you that no good so and so you want to say that so badly, but you want that child as they get older to formulate their own opinions and it may change. You know, you know, we we all forgive in a certain way and some don't hold on those grudges for life. So it's difficult to share such feedback because everybody's situation is different. You know, seek those other men in your life whether it's an uncle or brother, and let that child know that, hey, listen, unfortunately, this is the situation. It'd be very candid. You know, a lot, of, nowadays, we can't sugarcoat too much. You have to really keep it real on every level, um, but do it with a certain type of finesse, a motherly finesse, per se, and let them know that there are other great people who can be in your life. Mary, I think you wanted to, um, did you want to say something? Oh, okay, I thought you were saying something. So I think we are at the end of this segment, unless anyone else has any more comments. I was wondering, Alima, about the advice. We're yes. Giving advice, and I was thinking that- The very last be, question, if we had any advice, yeah. Mary? What would, would you, your advice? What would your advice? Way, what would your advice? To have everybody chime in a little bit. Yeah, I think it's important. Well, I was getting ready to go to that next, so. That is the last question from us. You know, what advice would you ladies, you know, and originally I said, what advice would you give to young women? But what advice would you give to young men and women? Linda? Um, I would say stay true to yourself. Stay true to who you are. Uh, set uh, reasonable goals. Uh, and uh, try to uh, reach for them uh, as, as, 
as much as you can. And um, so it, this is just uh, general, not to uh, single parents or anything, right? This is just a general question. Is that is that right, Alima? Yes, ma'am. This is just no. This is a question from from us. You know, the advice that you would give to young men and women. Yeah. Well, I I, I think that's it. I think you just stay true to yourself. Set goals. Follow your goals. Go to school. Get educated. I I remember telling my children and uh, when they were little, when you finish college, then we're gonna once you get out of college. So I, my son was nine and he said, can I just go on to college now and get it over with? So in my mind, college is really, really important. So I think that, you know, get your education and um, stay true to yourself. That would be what I would say. Laura? Yes. Um, it's interesting because I, I, I thought about this quite a bit and um, I guess really the parting advice would be to fully embrace the situation that you find yourself in. We, we can plan and plan, but in the end, you know, whether it's a, a man or a woman, keep your options open as you find yourself course correcting through your journey. You know, we can sit and mourn our losses or our yesterdays, but we really have to dive in and, and just live and, and, and see what life has to offer for us. Um, single, mothered, stepmother, whatever role we play, dive in, course correct. I mean, I thought I would have children. I got divorced at 37 and it didn't happen for me. So, you know, I, I mourned that for about a year or two and I changed course and I've been a very happy, optimistic person since probably almost ridiculously. So I've been told that sometimes, you know, is she really that happy? Um, I've had crazy moments, God knows, but I mean, not being a mother, I didn't choose for that to be a reason for me to not move on in a positive direction, in a positive way. Kim? Um, I would tell young women and men, just follow your heart, follow your dreams. Um, whatever your parents um, taught you, that toolkit they had given you, um, just stay on the, the, the right path. You're gonna make errors, you're gonna make mistakes, but just get up and move from that, you know, life. I know your mothers would love to live their life for you, but unfortunately they can't, but they give you the tools to go out there and make the, the best choices that's, uh, that's suitable for yourself. Just be true to yourself. Just be true and explore the, explore the world, you know, explore. Mary? Um, some of my advice would be to 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 laugh, to laugh even in the hard times, you know, and to know that happiness and love are a way of life and to forgive yourself and others quickly so you never harbor resentment or anger, which can really poison the soul and the spirit, to live your life from a foundation of faith and love and to know you are perfect and loved just the way you are every minute of your beautiful life. And do not ever be afraid to speak your truth, to question, to challenge the status quo. Be that good trouble, the disruptor. The world needs you to wake it up now and then. Always have a beautiful dream within your heart and share it with the world. Lastly, pray and pray often. That would be my advice. Amen. Elizabeth? Okay, I'm gonna be a little bit more scientific, science focused now. Um, as the person who always wanted to be a mother, um, I, I think um, you should uh, create your own destiny and try to create your own destiny. I mean, thing, life happens, but I think uh, we're at a, in an age right now where um, science is only getting better for women. And, and I think if you're a young woman now and you know at some point in your life you want to have a child, well, look into the science options or think about adoption. I mean, there's things like egg freezing now and uh, you know, a whole host of things that can, you can utilize science now to to 
put off your decision right now. You don't have to have a child. You don't have to settle with somebody because you think you need to have a child by the time you're 35 or whatever. I mean, there are options and I would think you should look at them so you can create your own destiny. I totally agree. <laughs> and, um, the eloquent Elkie, I on purpose decided to end with you <laughs> with this comment. <laughs> Thanks, Halima, no pressure. Okay, so here's my advice. Do not let anyone define who you are. Not your family, not your friends, not leaders, not society. You are the ultimate architect of your life. Embrace that power. You have the expanse of the horizon before you. Embrace your power and move forward with purpose. So we're not done because I got to give my, my closing soliloquy. But um, before we go, there was a comment from Wayne Ali Nurdin. And he says, for the record, I intend to recommend this program to every man I know. I consider this program way too valuable to miss out on. This is an invaluable resource to every person within the family. Thank you, Wayne Ali Nurdin. And I appreciate that. And I, I totally agree. Um, this has been amazing, you know. I mean, I, I I can't think of more words than amazing, lovely, wonderful. Um, you know, I would like to thank my lovely panelists, my sisters, my business consultants, my allies for your wisdom, for your honesty, for your intellect, your beauty, your zest, for speaking your truth. More importantly, I I thank you for just being the women that we are. You know, women of color catalyst allies. Our contributions will always be everlasting. And we are more than trailblazers, we are also trendsetters. That's why I created this platform because we do come in many shapes, forms, and sizes and come from different backgrounds. But at the end of the day, we are continuous trailblazers. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Um, please be advised that this segment will be available on Anything and Everything Media YouTube channel as well as on all major podcast platforms. Please also remember to visit www.anythingandeverythingmedia.com for updates and to support the women-owned businesses, the women and minority-owned businesses. So at the end of the day, as I always say, what I always say, come on, y'all, say it with me. Come on, just chime in and say, keep it moving. Keep, keep it moving. moving. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. And as Mary would say, to be continued. To be continued. There's much more where this came from. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.